Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 23 The Ebb Tide Runs. The coracle, as I had ample reason to know before I was done with her, was a very safe boat for a person my height and weight, both buoyant and clever in a seaway. But she was the most cross-grained, lopsided craft to manage. Do as you pleased, she always made more leeway than anything else, and turning round and round was the manoeuvre she was best at. Even Ben Gunn himself has admitted that she was queer to handle till you knew her way certainly i did not know her way she turned in every direction but the one i was bound to go the most part of the time we were broadside on and i am very sure i never should have made the ship at all but for the tide by good fortune paddle as i pleased the tide was still sweeping me down and there lay the hispaniola right in the fairway hardly to be missed First she loomed before me like a blot of something yet blacker than darkness. Then her spars and hull began to shake shape, and the next moment, as it seemed, for the further I went to the brisker grew the current of the ebb, I was alongside of her hawser, and had laid hold. The hawser was as taut as a bowstring, and the current so strong she pulled upon her anchor. All round the hull in the blackness the rippling current bubbled and chattered like a little mountain stream. One cut with my sea-gully and the Hispaniola would go humming down the tide. So far so good, but it next occurred to my recollection that a tight hawser, suddenly cut, is a thing as dangerous as a kicking horse. Ten to one, if I were so foolhardy as to cut the Hispaniola from her anchor, I and the coracle would be knocked clean out of the water. This brought me to a full stop, and if fortune had not again particularly favoured me, I should have had to abandon my design. But the light airs which had begun blowing from the south-east and south had hauled round after nightfall into the south-west. Just while I was meditating a puff came caught the Hispaniola, and forced her up into the current, and, to my great joy, I felt the hawser slacken in my grasp, and the hand by which I held it dip for a second under water. With that I made my mind up, took out my gully, opened it with my teeth, and cut one strand after another till the vessel swung only by two. Then I lay quiet waiting to sever these last when the strain should be once more lightened by a breath of wind. At this time I had heard the sound of loud voices from the cabin, but, to say the truth, my mind had been so entirely taken up with other thoughts that I had scarcely given ear. Now, however, when I had nothing else to do, I began to pay more heed. One I recognised for the coxswains. Israel hands that had been Flint's gunner in former days. The other was, of course, my friend of the red nightcap. Both men were plainly the worst of drink, and they were still drinking. For, even while I was listening, one of them, with a drunken cry, opened the stern window and threw out something which I divined to be an empty bottle. But they were not only tipsy. It was plain that they were furiously angry. Oaths flew like hailstones, and every now and then there came forth such an explosion as I thought was sure to end in blows. But each time the quarrel passed off, and the voices grumbled lower for a while, until the next crisis came, and in its turn passed away without result. On shore I could see the glow of the great campfire burning warmly through the shoreside trees. Someone was singing a dull, old, droning sailor's song, with a droop and a quaver at the end of each verse, and seemingly no end to it all but the patience of the singer. I had heard it on the voyage more than once, and remembered these words. 
But one man of the crew alive what put to sea with seventy-five. And I thought it was a ditty rather too dolefully appropriate for a company that had met such cruel losses in the morning. But indeed, from what I saw, all these buccaneers were as callous as the sea they sailed on. At last the breeze came. The schooner sidled and drew nearer in the dark. I felt the hawser slacken once more, and, with a good tough effort, cut the last fibres through. The breeze had but little action on the coracle, and I was almost instantly swept against the bows of the Hispaniola. At the same time the schooner began to turn upon her heel, spinning slowly, end for end, across the current. I wrought like a fiend, for I expected every moment to be swamped and since I found I could not push the coracle directly off, I now shoved straight astern. At length I was clear of my dangerous neighbour, and just as I gave the last impulsion my hands came across a light cord that was trailing overboard across the stern bulwarks. Instantly I grasped it. Why I should have done so I can hardly say. It was at first a mere instinct, but once I had it in my hands and found it fast, curiosity began to get the upper hand, and I determined I should have one look through the cabin window. I pulled in hand over hand on the cord, and, when I judged myself near enough, rose at infinite risk to about half my height, and thus commanded the roof and a slice of the interior of the cabin. By this time the schooner and her little consort were gliding pretty swiftly through the water. Indeed, we had already fetched up level with the campfire. The ship was talking, as sailors say, loudly, treading the immeasurable ripples with an incessant weltering splash, and until I got my eye above the window sill I could not comprehend why the watchman had taken no alarm. One glance, however, was sufficient and it was only one glance that I durst take from that unsteady skiff. It showed me hands and his companion locked together in deadly wrestle, each with a hand on the other's throat. I dropped upon the thwart again, none too soon, for I was near overboard. I could see nothing for the moment but these two furious encrimsoned faces swaying together under the smoky lamp and I shut my eyes to let them grow once more familiar with the darkness. The endless ballad had come to an end at last, and the whole diminished company about the campfire had broken into the chorus I had heard so often. Fifty men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, oh, oh, and, and a, a bottle, bottle of rum, drink and the devil have done for the rest. I was just thinking how busy drink and the devil were at that very moment in the cabin of the Hispaniola, when I was surprised by a sudden lurch of the coracle. At the same moment she yawed sharply, and seemed to change her course. The speed in the meantime had strangely increased. I opened my eyes at once. All around me were little ripples combing over with a sharp, bristling sound, and slightly phosphorescent. The Hispaniola herself, a few yards in whose wake I was still being whirled along, seemed to stagger in her course, and I saw her spars toss a little against the blackness of the night. Nay, as I looked longer, I made sure she also was wheeling to the southward. I glanced over my shoulder, and my heart jumped against my ribs. There, right behind me, was the glow of the campfire. The current had turned at right angles, sweeping round along with it the tall schooner and the little dancing coracle, ever quickening, ever bubbling higher, ever muttering louder. It went spinning through the narrows for the open sea. Suddenly the schooner in front of me gave a violent yaw, turning perhaps through twenty degrees, and almost at the same moment one shout followed another from on board. I could hear feet pounding on the companion ladder, and I knew that the two drunkards had at last been interrupted in their quarrel and awakened to a sense of their disaster. 
I laid down flat in the bottom of that wretched skiff, and devoutly recommended my spirit to its maker. At the end of the straits I had made sure we must fall into some bar of raging breakers, where all of my troubles would be ended speedily, and though I could perhaps bear to die, I could not bear to look upon my fate as it approached. So I must have lain for hours, continually beaten to and fro upon the billows, now and again wetted with flying sprays, and never ceasing to expect death at the next plunge. Gradually weariness grew upon me, a numbness, an occasional stupor fell upon my mind, even in the midst of my terrors, until sleep at last intervened, and in my sea-tossed coracle I lay and dreamed of home and the old Admiral Benbow. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 the cruise of the coracle. It was broad day when I awoke and found myself tossing at the southwest end of Treasure Island. The sun was up, but was still hid from me behind the great bulk of the spy glass, which on this side descended almost to the sea in formidable cliffs. Hall Bowline Head and Mizzenmass Hill were at my elbow, the hill bare and dark, the head bound with cliffs forty or fifty feet high, and fringed with great masses of fallen rock. I was scarcely a quarter of a mile to seaward, and it was my first thought to paddle in and land. That notion was soon given over. Among the fallen rocks the breakers spouted and bellowed, loud reverberations, heavy sprays flying and falling succeeded one another from second to second and I saw myself, if I ventured nearer, dashed to death upon the rough shore, or spending my strength in vain to scale the beetling crags. Nor was that all, for crawling together on flat tables of rock, or letting themselves drop into the sea with loud reports, I beheld huge slimy monsters, soft snails as it were, of incredible bigness two or three score of them together, making the rocks to echo with their barkings. I have understood since that they were sea-lions, and entirely harmless, but the look of them added to the difficulty of the shore and the high running of the surf, and was more than enough to disgust me of that landing-place. I felt willing rather to starve at sea than to confront such perils. In the meantime I had a better chance, as I supposed, before me. North of Hall Bolin Head the land runs in a long way leaving at low tide a long stretch of yellow sand. To the north of that again there comes another cape, Cape of the Woods, as it was marked upon the chart, buried in tall green pines which descended to the margin of the sea. I remembered what Silver had said about the current that sets northward along the whole west coast of Treasure Island, and seeing from my position that I was already under its influence, I preferred to leave Hall Bolin Head behind me and reserve my strength for an attempt to land upon the kindlier-looking Cape of the Woods. There was a great smooth swell upon the sea the wind blowing steadily and gentle from the south, there was no contrariety between that and the current, and the billows rose and fell unbroken. Had it been otherwise, I must long ago have perished, but, as it was, it is surprising how easily and securely my little and light boat could ride. Often, as I lay still at the bottom, and kept no more than an eye above the gunwale, I would see a big blue summit heaving close above me, yet the coracle would but bounce a little, dance as if on springs, and subside on the other side into the trough as lightly as a bird. I began after a little to grow very bold, and sat up to try my skill at paddling, but even a small change in the disposition of the weight will produce violent changes in the behaviour of a coracle, and I had hardly moved before the boat, giving up at once her gentle dancing movement, ran straight down a slope of water so steep that it made me giddy, and struck her nose with a spout of spray deep into the side of the next wave. I was drenched and terrified, 
and fell instantly back into my old position, whereupon the coracle seemed to find her head again, and led me softly as before among the billows. It was plain she was not to be interfered with, and, at any rate, since I could in no way influence her course, what hope had I of reaching land? I began to be horribly frightened, but I kept my head for all that. First, moving with all care, I gradually bailed out the coracle with my sea-cap. Then, getting my eye once more above the gunwale, I set myself to study how it was she managed to slip so quietly through the rollers. I found each wave, instead of the big, smooth, glossy mountain it looks from the shore, or from a vessel's deck, was for all the world like any range of hills on the dry land, full of peaks and smooth places and valleys. The coracle, left to herself, turning from side to side, threaded, so to speak, her way through these lower parts, and avoided the steep slopes and higher toppling summits of the wave. Well, now, thought I to myself, it is plain I must lie where I am, and not disturb the balance, but it is plain also that I can put the paddle over the side, and from time to time, in smooth paces, give her a shove or two towards land. No sooner thought upon than done. There I lay on my elbows in the most trying attitude, and every now and again gave a weak stroke or two to turn her head to shore. It was very tiring and slow work, yet I did visibly gain ground, and as we drew near the Cape of the Woods, though I saw I must infallibly miss that point, I had still made some hundred yards of easting. I was, indeed, close in. I could see the cool green tree-tops swaying together in the breeze, and I felt sure I should make the next promontory without fail. It was high time for I now began to be tortured with thirst. The glow of the sun from above, its thousandfold reflection from the waves, the sea-water that fell and dried upon me, caking my very lips with salt, combined to make my throat burn and my brain ache. The sight of the trees so near at hand had almost made me sick with longing, but the current had soon carried me past the point and, as the next reach of sea opened out, I beheld a sight that changed the nature of my thoughts. Right in front of me, not half a mile away, I beheld the Hispaniola, under sail. I made sure, of course, that I should be taken, but I was so distressed for want of water that I scarcely knew whether to be glad or sorry at the thought, and long before I had come to the conclusion, surprise had taken possession of my mind, and I could do nothing but stare and wonder. The Hispaniola was under her mainsail and two jibs, and the beautiful white canvas shone in the sun like snow or silver. When I first sighted her, all her sails were drawing. She was laying a course about northwest, and I presumed the men on board were going round the island on their way back to the anchorage. Presently she began to fetch more and more to the westward, so that I thought they had sighted me, and were going about in chase. At last, however, she fell right into the wind's eye, was taken dead aback, and stood there a while, helpless, with her sails shivering. "'Clumsy fellows,' said I, "'they must be still drunk as owls,' and I thought how Captain Smollett would have set them skipping." Meanwhile the schooner gradually fell off, and, filled again upon another tack, sailed swiftly for a minute or so, and brought up once more, dead in the wind's eye. Again and again this was repeated, to and fro, up and down, north, south, east, and west, the Hispaniola sailed by swoops and dashes, and, at each repetition, ended as she had begun, with idly flapping canvas. It became plain to me that nobody was steering. And, if so, where were the men? Either they were dead drunk, or had deserted her, I thought, and perhaps if I could get on board I might return the vessel to her captain. The current was bearing coracle and schooner southward at an equal rate. As for the latter's sailing, it was so wild and intermittent, and she hung each time so long in irons, that she certainly gained nothing. 
if she did not even lose. If I only dared to sit up and paddle, I made sure that I could overhaul her. The scheme had an air of adventure that inspired me, and the thought of the water-breaker beside the fore companion doubled my growing courage. Up I got, was welcomed almost instantly by another cloud of spray, but this time stuck to my purpose and set myself with all my strength and caution to paddle after the unsteered Hispaniola. Once I shipped a sea so heavy that I had to stop and bail, with my heart fluttering like a bird, but gradually I got into the way of the thing, and guided my coracle among the waves, with only now and then a blow upon her bows, and a dash of foam in my face. I was now gaining rapidly on the schooner. I could see the brass glisten on the tiller as it banged about, and still no soul appeared upon her decks. I could not choose but suppose she was deserted. If not, the men were lying drunk below, where I might batten them down, perhaps, and do what I chose with the ship. For some time she had been doing the worst thing possible for me, standing still. She headed nearly due south, yawing, of course, all the time. Each time she fell off, her sails partly filled, and these brought her in a moment right to the wind again. I have said this was the worst thing possible for me, for helpless as she looked in this situation, with the canvas crackling like cannon and the blocks trundling and banging on the deck, she still continued to run away from me, not only with the speed of the current, but by the whole amount of her leeway, which was naturally great. But now, at last, I had my chance. The breeze fell for some seconds very low and the current gradually turning her, the Hispaniola revolved slowly around her centre, and at last presented me her stern, with the cabin window still gaping open, and the lamp over the table still burning on into the day. The mainsail hung drooped like a banner. She was stock still but for the current. For the last little while I had even lost, but now, redoubling my efforts, I began once more to overhaul the chase. I was not a hundred yards from her when the wind came again in a clap. She filled on the port tack and was off again, stooping and skimming like a swallow. My first impulse was one of despair, but my second was towards joy. Round she came till she was broadside on to me, round still till she had covered a half and then two-thirds and then three-quarters of the distance that separated us. I could see the waves boiling white under her forefoot. Immensely tall she looked to me from my low station in the coracle. And then, of a sudden, I began to comprehend. I had scarce time to think, scarce time to act, and save myself. I was on the summit of one swell when the schooner came swooping over the next. The bowsprit was over my head. I sprang on my feet and leapt, stamping the coracle under water. With one hand I caught the jibboom, while my foot was lodged between the stay and the brace, and as I still clung there panting, a dull blow told me that the schooner had charged down upon and struck the coracle, and that I was left without retreat on the Hispaniola. End of chapter 24